Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we at CAM are excited to have you with us this evening for a very special program. I am Taylor Renee Aldrich, the visual arts curator at CAM. And today I'm joined by an artist, an artist, Nonlin Pierre, who is featured in my exhibition, Enunciated Life. In Enunciated Life, Black spiritual beliefs operate as a point of departure for considering modes of surrender. The exhibition's title is derived from the scholarship of Ashanti Crawley, who recognizes the beauty and power of breathing within Black Pentecostalism. To enunciate life, he writes, life that is exorbitant, capacious, and fundamentally social, though it is also a life that is structured through, an, excuse me, structured through and engulfed and engulfed by brutal violence. Enunciated life, in other words, alerts us to the audaciousness of Black breath that endures in the wake of continued anti-Blackness. Through video, painting, photography, and installation, the range of artists and enunciated life help us explore the various bodily experiences that transpire through religion. They also make clear the far less legible elements that surround the event of incarnation, such as desire, longing, faith, and vulnerability. With that said, um, I will introduce Nadine Pierre, who has contributed a recent painting to the show. Uh, she is New York based, a New York based painter and current resident of the Studio Museum in Harlem, along with Elliot Reed and E. Jane. Through her depiction of centrally painted and vibrantly colored figures, Pierre's portraiture explores the desire to become something more than a single being. And she, is al she also highlights the communities that allow for that sense of self-making. In her earlier works, Pierre has incorporated art historical references with religious iconography to expound upon narratives of spiritual encounters that have been sustained for centuries. Curating, curator of A Longing Vessel, the culminating Studio Museum Artist Residency Show, Legacy Russell writes, Pierre expands the gilded frame, making space for new figures to stand within and take up space newly. For the artists, these figures are alter egos and avatars in their own right. At times, standing in Pierre's place as a shield, shroud, an embrace that offers the artist distance from the canonized crush of Western ways of seeing. Welcome, friend. So good Hi, to have friend. you here in the CAM virtual space. How are you? Good to be here. Sorry about the siren. Um, Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm excited to dig into this with you um, and really excited to be part of Enunciated Life. Yeah, we're excited to have you um, in the museum. Um, and so with that said, um, I'll just get into the first question. Uh, the work you contributed to Enunciated Life for a little while longer was made almost four years ago when you were working in concepts of spirituality and religion. Can you talk about your work um, and how it has shifted since then? What new questions are you engaging in your practice at the moment? Yeah, I, you know, I think my work has shifted in a lot of different ways. Um, some more subtle, some more um, apparent. Um, but one thing that's changed is I think there's a lot more detail in these alternate characters, like these accessory characters. Um, if you look at for a little while longer, there's a little less um, definition in the facial features and sort of even in the atmosphere around the, the characters. Um, they're in this non-space, which they are today and in the current work, but this non-space is a bit fuzzy um, and there's a bit more um, of a relaxed way of uh, exploring the form. Um, but I think a lot of things are still the same in the work. Longing has been part of the work um, since the beginning, you know, that's a huge part of the work and it, it, it continues to be. Um, I do consider the work that I'm making as like a giant body of work, um, you know, that I'm, I'm just kind of building on. So yeah, I'm digging into ideas in the current work surrounding escape uh, through world building, fantasy, pleasure, power, and refusal. And so um, I'm asking myself and the viewer, how many ways uh, can a place or a person be reimagined? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so what initially drew me to your work uh, was your ability to, de to depict a clear longing between completely mysterious figures. Um, there's a withholding in your work uh, that interests me, and it's this withholding that has a little further 
a thread of longing that is tied to faith, um, a faith that is uh, a faith in things unseen, uh, the sometimes myth mythical and opaque. And I want to begin by talking about your interest in aestheticizing this particular desire. Uh, but specifically, I want to ask, how do you maintain a practice of withholding? Uh, withholding withholding in a field that is so interested in representation, visibility, and biography? How do you insist on being contextualized into not being a single being? You know, I'm always asking that question, like, how many boxes can I dodge before, like, someone grabs me and puts me in a place where they think I should be? I think it's an ongoing task. Um, it takes a, like, a deliberateness to try and provide doors and windows into the work while keeping things sacred um, or hidden. Uh, I think the work is layered and that helps. It's layered in its physicality, literally with paint on top of paint. And it's also layered in its meaning and structure. So that helps because um, I can leave sort of messages for myself from my past selves to my future selves and my current selves. Um, and I crave that mystery, I crave and respect it. Um, so there are things about the work that I don't know and I don't care to know. And I think that's what helps me, um, I guess it helps me keep things um, just inaccessible, but in a way that also allows me to explore because not everything's figured out and that's important. Yeah. Yeah, I want to just uh, invoke uh, the curator Legacy Russell again here because she um, she saw a proposal of Enunciated Life. She was one of the first people to see a proposal of that exhibition, um, and from that, uh, I guess she started engaging you. And you know, it was announced that you would be one of the residents at, at the studio, um, and she strategically paired you and I a year ago um, so that I could write about your work around this, this exhibition that is now on view at, at the Studio Museum. Um, and it's sort of like I had been following your work and like standing your work for a long time. And I was trying to figure out like, I need her in the show. I don't know what the entry point is gonna be. Um, and then Legacy just sort of came in and was just like, you two need to know each other. Taylor would be great to write about your work, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so I'm really thankful for that, that sort of um, strategic pairing. Um, because it's been really great just like talking with you in a very organic way. Um, and initially uh, last March when we were first connected was when I was supposed to come and do a studio visit and everything and like learn more about your work, see your work. Um, and obviously, you know, as history goes, we all know what happened. Mm -hmm. um, but I do want to like press a little bit further there and talk a little bit about what it means to share your work and the sort of um, the things that you're withholding in the work. What does it mean to share with a trusted group of people, if not the entire art world? Um, I imagine you have a, a cadre of curators, writers, friends, people who you're able to talk freely about um, these particular things that you're exploring in your work that you may not want to be known to a wider public. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think um, <clears throat> it's definitely like it takes time to build that. And I think, you know, we have that. We've had these conversations that have been so, um, that have gone really deep into the work. And it's nice to have that, but also to take it to a place where we can include the audience, but also keep that, um, like I said before, keep some of those areas of the work really sacred. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm still figuring it out. But there are moments where I'm like, I'll just like drop that. Let's see. Mm -hmm. And let's like mm -hmm. expand that and then wait. And just because in this moment, I don't want to share something doesn't mean that um, I won't share it in the future. I think it's like a metering out of information, not only because the, the canvas and the painting is literally withholding from me. There are times where I want to access it and it's like, no you can't access this image right now. So that teaches me how to then um, create that kind of barrier or that like opacity for um, the viewer. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes the best things happen slowly. And so as this world is unfolding for me, 
I'm like allowing myself to explore and expand and then bringing certain people in to explore the world with me. Um, but it doesn't mean it has to be everybody. Um, there are aspects of the work that I think, yeah, they're like accessible easily and that's great. And it's the surface of the work and that stuff isn't less important than some of the other things within the work. But I don't know, I think I love a mystery. I love the drama of a mystery. I love a slow reveal, like tease it out. So um, I think I just, I interact with the work that way. And so I would hope that others um, do the same. Yeah, speaking a little bit more, a little bit more about that withholding. I want to talk about um, a little bit more about your current works on view. Um, in particular, uh, there, in particular, there's a show again at MoMA PS One, a longing vessel curated by Legacy Russell, which fe features your works as well as E. Jane and Elliot Reed. And the works are presented in an unconventional orientation. Uh, can you talk about the significance of these particular works, these new works in relationship to the one that's on view at CAM? Yeah. Again, sort of just marking that trajectory and how you arrived um, at this particular study and orientation of presentation. Yeah, I first wanna take this moment to just say that the residency at the Studio Museum was a really incredible moment for me to really expand and explore my own practice. And I'm so thankful that I did it alongside E and Elliot because I think we did that work together. Um, and I'm really proud of what we did um, at PS1. And I hope that people can see it if they can or like experience it digitally. Um, but in terms of the work and the way that it's hung, I knew that I wanted to change the air of the space. I wanted it to feel different once you walked across the threshold into the room. And more specifically with these two works that we see right now, um, I wanted to disrupt the viewing experience. So these two works um, are kind of, they call to mind motion, action, movement. And I felt like I really wanted to um, create this experience of the works leaning out towards the viewer. So it then forces the viewer to alter where their body is to experience different parts of the work. Um, and for me, that's like asking something of the viewer. It's asking them to do a bit more work to get access to the image and to any other things like the texture or even staring, you know, at the sides of the paintings and seeing these um, shadows that then become other portals, um, other areas, other voids to imagine into. So uh, yeah, that was an exploration of changing the space, changing the air, changing the feeling, the vibe. And um, I really like that we were able to make that happen. So I want to transition and talk a little bit about um, the books that you have been engaging with throughout the past year since we've been talking. Um, Edwidge Dandicat comes up a lot for in our conversations. Um, who are the others you, you care Christina to mention? Christina Sharp in the wake. Yes. Whoa, a big and, one. Yes. And can you talk, before I get into like my question, I do want to hear you talk a little bit about the significance of those two in particular and like the element that you're engaging with um, mm -hmm. in these newer works. Yeah. This body of work um, that's in this longing vessel, um, it's introducing another element into this world that I'm building out, a liquid water. It's, um, it's introducing this other like uh, way of taking up space in the compositions. And so where there was fire before, we now have water as well. So the world is expanding for me and I'm understanding it a bit more. And I think um, water became really like upfront in my mind after reading or while reading In the Wake and um, some of Adanika's work. And yeah, just reading stories about um, migration over passages of water, large and small. Um, it just like opened something up for me in this world. And so, yeah, now this world is not only hot, it's also damp. So I'm excited. Like it's just, there's more to be explored. Um, and I'm starting here with some water. 
Yeah, I think from that too, just um, thinking about your engagement with water as well as fryer, but specifically water, um, it's allowed me to sort of uh, consider scholarship and, and narrative around the Arisha Azili um, and thinking about the entanglement um, this Arisha has with water. Um, and also like thinking more deeply about that, um, there is a waywardness there. There isn't a sort of errancy that water allows for us to revel in and exist in. Um, so with that being said, I'm gonna bring, bring in another book. That bring it up. <laughs> really foundational um, to your work, um, but specifically thinking about the characters. There's a, there's a defiance in some of them. There's a waywardness. There is a, a refusal, um, you know, inerrancy. Um, and so I particularly want to invoke uh, the, the definition that Sadia Hartman offers in this book, Wayward Lives, yeah. um, which focuses on and indexes a group of Black, some queer women moving waywardly throughout the time of post-emancipation in the 19th and 20th century. And in it, uh, Sadia Hartman writes, waywardness, the avid longing for a world not ruled by master man or police, the errant path taken by the leaderless swarm in search of a place better than here, the social poesis that sustains the dispossessed, wayward, the unregulated movement of drifting and wandering, sojourns without a fixed destination, ambulatory possibility, interminable migrations, rush and flight, black locomotion, the everyday struggle to live free, the attempt to elude capture and never settling. So with that said, um, you know, I think a lot of your characters um, embody this sort of feeling that Hartman describes as, as the wayward person, the wayward woman. Um, and for me, I think, um, I would love to just hear you talk about your interest in this type of errancy and defiance. Mm -hmm. And what does it mean for you and, and the avatars in your work? Yeah, huge, huge, huge. Waywardness is possibility. Um, I'm gonna add from that same passage to the definition, an mm -hmm. exploration of what might be. And I think um, rebellion and refusal are really important parts of freedom. And in my work, I think for me, it comes across as um, the right to being illegible. <sighs> there is like, there is a longing to be understood, to be accepted, like can't get away from that, right? But there also is an even more, like it's a bigger need to be illegible and to grab that back. Um, it's, it's about controlled access. Um, there's protection in rebellion. And so um, I think waywardness in the work for me is like the gathering of these beings. They understand they're being seen. They're allowing you access into these pictures, into these stills, um, but there's no linear narrative. It's circular. You don't know where they're going, if they're coming from someplace, if they're going somewhere else. Um, yeah. That's, the, I mean, I could go on. The whole talk could be about waywardness. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, all I'm gonna, that's all I'm gonna say. No, I appreciate that, you know, because I think the, the waywardness and the errancy is carried out because of a search for something more, like an otherwise possibility, which is something Ashawn Crawley talks about all the time. It's like thinking about another way of living and another way of existing in the world that is different from the status quo and what we're conditioned to, to believe and carry out, right? Yeah, and waywardness um, can't be waywardness without imagination. Absolutely, absolutely. Right? Absolutely, yeah. and I think that's a part of this sort of freedom practice that we're thinking about. And in the context of enunciated life, um, you know, the, these comments that you were talking about sort of resisting uh, definition or resisting being coherent or readable. Like, I think about that sort of, I think about the practice of Black faith and spirituality across the board as a way to sort of resist westernized gazes, white gazes, uh, white engagement, you know, like 
I think obviously, um, you know, white people are able to enjoy the sort of outcomes of black faith practices, music, movement, so on and so forth. But there, there is that sort of inherent uh, sort of resistance that just exists there where they can't fully engage, generally speaking. Um, so yeah, I, I think, you know, I just wanna move into a space of talking about the technique, you know, and how you actually come to render these figures through a painting practice, which requires a lot of time, a lot of imagination, a lot of world making. Mm -hmm. um, I had the pleasure of like doing, I think your work sort of directed me into revisiting the work of Belka Sayon, who is a late uh, Cuban artist, printmaker, um, as well as Bob Thompson, a Black American artist who is also no, no longer living. Um, but they both sort of engage with this, uh, this spiritual, biomythic, sort of uh, otherworldly type of scene making. Um, and so I just want to invoke them here and also get you to talk a little bit about technique and, and how you engage with or how you change and engage with the, the, the painting practice. Yeah. Firstly, I want to say that Belkis and Bob are two people that I would have loved to meet that I feel a kinship with even beyond the artwork. Um, I feel like I I'm attempting some of the similar things like moving in this space about creation and like remixing reality. But um, in terms of technique, I think building up the surface of the canvas is like a huge thing for me. Um, I literally have to uh, wait for paint to dry to reassess composition or color or even add a character. I rarely paint wet into wet because um, I like that resistance, the canvas resisting the brush and like scrubbing into it, you know, that dry brush technique is really important for me because it allows this like wistfulness to be in the work. Um, and I think composition is huge for me as well. I don't do studies before I start paintings. I just do like thumbnails, little small little sketches, like chicken scratch really you would think like did she go to art school like she can't draw but um I try to work out some sort of composition and then I kind of let intuition take over but in my most recent works um the triangle keeps coming back in the composition and I realize that it's um it's a lot about uh foundation it's a lot about um creating that like pillar to then bolster this um this alter ego, this avatar that needs to get from one place to another, maybe moving through different places in this world. Um, so yeah, technique is really important to me, even like exploring the form and the figure and like re-evaluating and reimagining what anatomy looks like and like, what can this wing be used for? It can be used for um, structure. It can be used to fill up the composition or for texture. Um, to create depth in the work um, or maybe the elbows a bit too long or like too far from the wrist and that's a bit jarring and all of that is like in the work um, and calling back to a really long history of painting the figure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I'm gonna throw in a question I didn't share with you prior to so here but since we're talking about technique I do want to hear you talk about how you render hands. There is something particularly just erotic about the hands. Um, and I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about that. It's, it's become sort of a signature, I think, in your work. Let's get into it. <laughs> um, touch is huge. I think touch goes along with this like moment of pleasure and there's um there's a section of the book wayward lives where um the author says in a moment of tenderness the future seems possible and i just think like in those moments where these there's so much going on in these compositions and it's like two fingers touch it's like the electricity there like what is happening between those fingers um 
I'm interested in those moments. So not only are you zooming out and seeing these larger moments, you're seeing these moments with hands and, and appendages that connect. Um, you can kind of think about what's the pressure like? How much pressure is being applied? Like, can, can they feel like the skin or like the pores or the hairs, like what's going on? And so um, I think hands, the way that I render them, they're not necessarily realistic but they do give you a sense of like tension. Like a lot of the time the fingers will be tense or they're holding on to something or they're just placed in kind of unrealistic um, configurations, but you still are convinced a hand is a hand and what a hand does is a hand touches and it holds and it can strike. Um, but yeah, it's a hand and there's so much possibility in a hand. It can carry, it can heal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so many things, so many possibilities there. Um, okay, I'm going, I'm just going to wrap up with this last question, then we can open it up to the audience. Um, I want to discuss uh, the fantastical in your work. Uh, your painting scenes are otherworldly. However, there's a familiarity in how, how your subjects engage with one another, given the touch, the hand. Uh, there are economies of care at play. Um, and they signify a relation between all types of, of loved ones, uh, from peers to elders, to friends, to lovers. Can you talk about how the fantastical allows you to think through the inheritance of care and perhaps even pleasure and joy? Yeah. I mean, firstly, what would life be without dreams of possibilities and fantasy? Like, what would life be without making the unimaginable imaginable. So first off, fantasy for me is a way of escape. But then it becomes, how do I experience the world and then experience this avatar experiencing her world? And where do our experiences overlap? I, you know, a lot of people ask me like, do you paint people you know into the paintings? Like, is this you in the paintings? Um, and the answer is no um, for both questions. I think I let my subconscious pull forth faces and features and hairstyles and things. And, and I think that residue from my world enters that world, just like residue from that world enters my world. Um, so there is a familiar aspect in the compositions and in the moments of care, because I think partly I'm creating things that I want to experience, but with some distance because it's not me, right? But I'm also approaching the canvas like with my full experience being on this earth um, and trying to find a way to create moments for other people to tap into. So yeah it's it's familiar to me as well and sometimes i can step back and be like oh okay like that kind of reminds me of so and so or like you know this hairstyle is kind of like this thing or that and i like that too in the moment i'm creating and kind of painting like i'm not always there to see but then you step back or like maybe someone sees themselves in the painting and i'm here for it i think it's great to see to have people like connect to the painting in that way and i think um, there's an overlap between these two worlds that I'm trying to navigate. I have a question before we open it up to Q&A, just another question about, um, I just wanna have a retrospect moment and think about the earlier works. Um, did you use, in the earlier works there, for those not familiar, um, there is a sort of religious iconography that you take up. Um, and you sort of expound upon it a little bit more, inserting avatars and characters. People thought they were you. Maybe they are you, maybe they're not. Um, but I wanna just probe a little bit more there and get you to talk about what that, that use of religious iconography meant for you um, as a device. Yeah. Uh, how was it helpful for you in that beginning stage of your practice? Yeah, you know, I like to keep my toolbox packed and I like to reach back and grab things and use them and put them back. And religious iconography 
uh, is a tool like color and texture and composition. Um, so for me, I was using it and still am, but in different ways to create a sense of like my own personal mythology. And so um, grappling with my own kind of experiences with my upbringing and sort of my own experience of, of what religion can look like um, across the diaspora and across my own personal diaspora. Um, yeah, I just think it was important for me to access that. Also, um, I found that a lot of my earliest inspirations and like connections to art, you know, came from religious artwork. So it, it's kind of a, nat a natural starting point for me, um, but then expanding it to fit what I want to see, uh, rather what's what's been given to me. I don't even know if that answered your question, but okay. Um, okay. it's a tool. And I kind of, I like to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And I don't want to be told like how to do it. Mm -hmm. So um, I never really put things down. I kind of just like put one in a pocket or like throw one over my shoulder, like pull something to the forefront. Um, because why not? I can be all the things I want to be and take up whatever space I want to take up and create from whatever lens I want to create. And um, yeah, I hope that that's what I'm doing. Absolutely, that was a, a great answer. Um, all right, so I'm going to get into the questions from the audience. Please, um, you know, send your questions in. We have a little time here. Um, from Barbara. Uh, waywardness or illegibility depends on benefit of the doubt, question mark. So is your principle of waywardness largely a private endeavor? If not, how do or did you get the art world to appreciate the incoherency of concept? It's a dense Great question. question. Dense, okay. <laughs> Love it. Um, I think this is an ongoing practice. I don't know if I'll ever fully arrive, but it's something that I think about a lot. Um, I think waywardness is both personal and in the work. Um, the way that I'm like pushing all the figures to the forefront of the canvas, like where's the foreground, where's the middle ground, where's the background? It's um, pushing against like physics and and how things are kind of set up in our like universe the way that i'm using light is wayward um because it doesn't make sense to a more traditional way of setting up a painting um can you read the question again <laughs> sure um waywardness or illegibility depends on benefit of the doubt question mark so is your principle of waywardness largely a private endeavor? I would say yes, um, but we'd love to hear your answer. Uh, if not, how do or did you get the art world to appreciate the incoherency of concept? Yeah, okay. So waywardness, both private and apparent like in the work. Um, and in terms of the art world appreciating, I don't know, I kind of, just believe in doing my thing and yeah, <laughs> we'll see. If I don't they know. Like it, they like it, if they don't, they don't. If they like it, they like it, but I'm making work for myself. I'm making work to heal myself, to understand my experience, but also to connect to something bigger than me. Um, yeah. Yeah. I will add to though, just to probe a little bit further, like there is an act of resistance that you are committing to when you are insisting on incoherency, when people ask you or try to sort of place you in a particular box that they want you in, in a coverage story or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so I do, I just wanna name that here. And I do think that like, um, I think some of us, myself included, appreciate the incoherency of concept in that regard, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and if others don't, so be it. Yeah, I mean, to go back to Hartman's words, um, an attempt to elude capture by never settling. That. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I hope that answers your question, Barbara. Um, anonymous attendee says, do you listen to music while you paint? And if so, what genres? Any favorites you return to again and again? Wow. Um, yeah, I listen to music when I paint. I think it's, com it's completely connected. Um, I can get at the same place in silence, but I think music helps me kind of get there um, a bit faster. Um, I listen to everything and anything that makes me feel. Um, and favorites, I have to get back to you on that. Okay. Um, the light in your paintings comes from within, almost like a movie, even though the images don't move. This is from Joseph, by the way. They also seem so much bigger than the canvas. Do you ever want to step off the canvas and animate or think about stained glass? Um, yeah, I think about what's next and other ways to build out this world in a more three-dimensional way. Um, I do feel that the, the paintings are like stills from a moving image and one day I'd love to explore that. Um, yeah, great question. Yeah. All right, there's um, a question for me and you. Taylor, can you talk about the artist selection process and enunciated life and why you precisely chose Nadlene for inclusion? Similarly, Nadlene, can you share your reaction to the exhibition thesis and how it contextualizes your work? You wanna go first? Let you start. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't remember when I first saw Nadlene's paintings, but I, I'm pretty sure it was on Instagram. Um, and then I got roped in um, via Legacy Russell to, to start talking with Nadlene. Um, but what attracted me to her work and, and particularly thinking about Enunciated Life is I felt that her paintings captured the intimacy and the longing that I wanted to, that I was interested in sort of platforming in Enunciated Life around Black Pentecostalism and possession in general. Um, and so thinking sp specifically about spiritual possession, um, when we're anointed or touched by the spirit and, you know, you, you speak in tongues, it, you know, it looks like a, a myriad of things. Uh, but long story short, you're possessed by the spirit, you're possessed by something. Um, and so I was really interested in sort of um, the way that Nodlene renders intimacy and sensuality and the sort of caring that happens in those spaces when people are possessed by spirits. Um, there's, a, there's a, a chorus of care, I think, um, but also a chorus of desire, like people long to be possessed by the spirit. Um, and it's important to say that, you know, I use Black Pentecostalism as a point of departure, but I'm thinking about all terms, all forms of possession. Uh, we could be self-possessed, we can be possessed by our ancestors. Um, there are many, many forms of possession that I'm thinking about. Um, but I, I just, you know, in that regard, I felt like Nodling's work really captured that feeling that I was really interested in for the show. Yeah, and for me, I was thrilled when, um, when I found that I would be included because I think one, being in the room with that group of artists is amazing. And I love when painting is up against all these different um, mediums and so, just on that level, I think that was great. Um, but then in talking about anointing and what that looks like, I felt like that was a huge part and is a huge part of the touch that's in the work um, that I'm making. And I felt like um, we in our conversation tapped into something and to some of these through lines and, and to see it come together with this group of really um, amazing artists, I was thrilled. Am thrilled because it's still up. <laughs> yeah, hopefully people will be able to see it. We'll see how LA COVID restrictions go. Um, yeah. But thank you for that question, anonymous attendee. Um, we have about three more questions. Four more questions. Uh, Nadlene, what do you do in your free time? In <laughs> other words, are there practices in your life that make their way into the work? Yeah, 
In my free time, I do a lot of things. I love to sleep. When you're sleeping, you can dream. That's great. Sometimes if I'm really stuck with a painting, I'll take like a little anxiety nap. And sometimes that's all you need to get through, you know, a part of a painting that's not being resolved. Um, but I think I get really energized um, when reading and also listening to music and, and, and getting in touch with uh, movement and dance. Um, so those are all things I do in my free time along with um, television um, and films which I think can be really transformative. Um, I'm gonna talk about this episode till the day I die, but um, in Lovecraft Country, that episode mm -hmm. where Hippolyta names and renames herself, like that has stayed with me and will stay with me for the rest of my life. Like, I think there's something really powerful about um, moving images and, and television. And I've been really into science fiction. So I, do, I like watch and read that in my free time. Is desire ever dangerous in your work? Yes. <laughs> I think, yeah, like Western Zander got a little danger. Um, mm -hmm. I think in the work, especially in this world that I'm building out, there's space for contradictions. There's space for um, the unknown and some of like, like a little tinge of malice here and there. Um, I mean, fire can burn you up, but it can also purify. Water can drown you, but it can also transform and move you places. So um, I think, yeah, those contradictions are really important to the work and, and danger is there as well. How do you think about color in your work? Um, so few of the avatars seem to have recognizable skin tones from our world. Yeah. That is, a, that's a conscious decision to um, remove as many connections to reality as I can. Um, and so using color to disrupt what is expected um, is really important to the work and to me, but it's also about um, allowing these characters, especially the central character to take up and to, to reimagine herself. So she appears and reappears in different colors and different forms. And I think that is hinting towards this idea of multiplicity um, and being allowed to be in many forms or resisting capture. All right, the questions keep coming in. So we wanna keep going. Um, <laughs> and what way is Caribbean-ness infused in the work? Yeah. I am a first generation uh, Haitian American. Um, that's a part of who I am no matter what. And I think it's part of the work as much as just me being black creates nuances in the work. So I don't necessarily have to like call it to the forefront, but it, it finds its way there because it's fully a part of who I am. It's in my DNA and my makeup. Um, I definitely have heard that my color sense is Caribbean, um, which I'm not mad at. Um, and I think this like this connection to something bigger than you. I think there's like such a respect, um, I think in Caribbean culture for like bigger things, for things unseen um, that I think uh, is part of that. Mm -hmm. Nadleen um, from Quinn McNichol. Uh, Nadleen, thank you for sharing your work with us. I'm also a painter and I really resonate with your paintings and the way you talk about them. Tell us if there are any images you keep in your studio as in inspiration or motivation. Yeah, you know what? I have a Bob Thompson book here with me. I have an El Greco book. I have a book on William Blake. Um, but yeah, to be honest, the inspiration comes from feelings and then those feelings turn into images. And sometimes that, I don't know, it, it can connect to some of these other images that I've seen, but, um, 
yeah, the inspiration comes from so many different things, but I do like keep those books close to my heart. Um, okay, we've, we've gotten 45 minutes in um, before actually talking about COVID. So here's a COVID question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, has COVID or the experience of quarantine changed your approach to either the painting process or the subjects you're working with? Yeah, I think isolation has. Um, I think in the in the thick of things, I wasn't able to paint. I think it was just too much. It was too heavy. Um, Yeah, it has. I think I'm still figuring out what that looks like, but you don't go through a year or a moment like this without being changed. Absolutely. Um, so this next question is from an anonymous attendee. It seems like the secondary characters in your work have become more defined over time, developing personalities on their own what has the experience been like to meet them and be introduced to their world? Which makes me think of Toni Morrison, you know, and thinking about her characters is a great question. Um, yeah, what has the experience been like to meet them and be introduced to their world? Honestly, it's life-changing. They have been um, metering out their existence to me over time and they've been forming and allowing me to have access to them. And as I get to know them, I feel like I feel connected to them. I feel loved by them. I feel held by them. Um, and sometimes I just stand back and I'm like, am I painting imaginary friends? Like, <laughs> but it does feel like I'm in communion with these characters and um, they hold secrets for me when I can't really do it myself. So um yeah I, I'm excited to um see their faces and their texture and um I think as the work grows their space will grow and in this newest body of work at PS1 I created these really long tall uh guardian-like figures and that's the first time that I've allowed them to take up all of this space and I'm excited to see where that goes because they're like, all right, you're ready to meet us now. And so now I'm like meeting them and who else will I meet? Who knows, but I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited too. Um, so that concludes the audience questions, um, but I do wanna end um, by just first saying thank you, but also just posing one more question to you. Um, what's on the horizon for you? What what new themes or things are you thinking about currently? What's inspiring you at the moment? Yeah, um, I am really inspired by um, science fiction at the moment. And um, I think I'm like leaning into that a bit in this moment, but again, like fantasy, escape, pleasure, power, those are the things that I'm exploring. They always were there, but it's like certain things come to the forefront and other things step back. Um, my previous body of work, I was really heavily thinking about love um, and its afflictions. <laughs> and it's all the things that come with that. And before then I was thinking about um, protection. And while those themes still carry the work, other things are like, it's my turn now. Like, I'm gonna leave now. So in this moment, I'm thinking a lot about escape, fantasy, power, pleasure. Um, yeah. Okay, so since I said there were no more questions, there's like three more questions now. Since we have hey. time, since we have like five minutes, I'm gonna just keep going because this is a pretty interesting question. Um, Taylor, you spoke of possession, which reminds me a lot of Yoruba spiritual practices and ceremonies. Taylor, are you interested in African and or indigenous mythologies and thought systems? I'm thinking specifically of Wudun and Ifa. For example, given your Haitian background, I assume this is for Nadlin, and the histories mm -hmm. of Afro-Caribbean surrealism, or if somebody knows something about my background that I haven't expressed yet. 
Um, yeah, so are you interested in African and or indigenous mythologies? I'm very much interested in them, yes. Um, I think uh, Black Pentecostalism and Enunciated Life uh, just gives me a sort of way in to explore those other practices more uh, and thinking about um, the ways in which uh, Yoruba spiritual practices and practices from the continent have been sort of hidden and mined through Western religion. Um, so I'm really interested in that tension um, and particularly thinking about how um, people within the diaspora have been able to hide or um, maintain their faith practices even when white Western religious practices were imposed on them. Um, I personally don't have a practice in Voodoo or Ifa, but I'm very interested in it. And I think it's um, a, a viable way of existing in the world. Um, there's a follow-up question that says, Nadlene, are you interested in Voodoo or Ifa or African Yoruba traditions? I think it's definitely part of the lineage um, of being in this body, but I'm more so interested in creating something of my own, something um, cobbled together with what I was given. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, in there. Thank you so much, Nadlene. There was another question here that's asking, Ta Taylor, what's inspiring you? And I just want to say Nadlene's work has been a great inspiration for <laughs> me. So it's been such a pleasure getting to know you this past year. And I'm so grateful to have your work at CAM in Enunciated Life. Um, and thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. And thank you, Taylor. You know, we've had such expansive conversations and you have practiced so much care with writing about my work and exploring the work and allowing me to have agency in those moments. So I'm so thankful that we could um, take this conversation to an audience and really um, let them into our, our moments that we've had. So I'm thankful for this platform and for this moment and for being included in the show. Yeah, thank you, thank you, absolutely. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, you can follow CAM and find out about more of our programs at cammuseum.org. And, you know, my colleague Alessandra Mitchell has is hosting a, a really robust series of programs this season. So please follow and stay tuned. Thank you everyone for joining and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you everyone. Bye. <laughs>